In 2008, the Baylor Chelonian Center and Turtle Conservancy organized a trip to Argentina and Uruguay. We spent months pre-arranging our contacts, permits, travel arrangements, video and camera equipment in order to make this trip a success. We landed in Buenos Aires December the 6th, 2008, a city of over 12 million people, which many consider to be the Paris of South America. It is a very European city, punctuated with outdoor cafes, parks, and a thriving bohemian culture. It's not hard to notice that Catholicism is the dominant religion when wandering the streets of Buenos Aires and viewing its architecture. The cuisine is almost strictly carnivorous. The quality of the meat and the simple way it's prepared over an open flame makes it some of the best in the world. Being a vegetarian outcast, Peter had to make do with a few unexciting options. The way of life is laid back and a daily siesta is mandatory. Many past traditions and local colloquialisms have continued into this century. The gaucho and cowboy culture, along with numerous religious superstitions. And for a quick tryst, there's a love motel in every town. Argentina is the world's eighth largest country, only slightly smaller than India, with a population of just over 40 million people, most of whom are concentrated in the urban centers, making the countryside feel vast and empty. Many naturalists have described Argentina as having some of the most spectacular landscapes on the planet. So we were here to do what we always do, search for the country's native turtles and tortoises. Specifically, our objective was to better understand the distribution, status and ecology of the Argentine tortoises. Within the scientific community, there has been ongoing confusion and debate as to how many truly valid species exist. So our goal was to answer these questions. Our first destination was the Buenos Aires Zoo, one of the oldest zoos in South America, where much of the original architecture is still intact. We observed a few regional turtle species, Phrynops hilleri, Hydromedusa tectophora, Trachemis dorbigani, and the ubiquitous red-eared sliders from the States. Oh, that's a threesome. The Phrynops hilleri are so gentle, but they seem to be piling on one after the other. Here we have the exhibit of the Chaco tortoises. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know the origin. So the Chaco tortoise is a very common pet uh, in, in Buenos Aires, and they are sold in pet stores, originating from the north, from Santiago de El Estero, from Cordoba, or from Mendoza. And right here behind me, there is a, a little bit T-formed, bumpy female laying the eggs. We arranged a meeting with one of the few reptile dealers and herpetologists in Uruguay, David Fabius, who would be arranging some of our itinerary and contacts throughout our trip. After arriving in Montevideo and meeting with David, he generously offered to take us into the field, diverting our focus from the Argentine tortoises for a day to find the seldom seen Acantochilis spixi in the wild. At 7 a.m., all five of us crammed into his small car and headed east along the coast. Approximately 200 kilometers from Montevideo, past Punta del Este, to the town of Castillos. We had a quick lunch at La Barca, where we left a data logger, which would collect important climactic information for a full year. By midday, we began our search for Ocantochilis spixi, a species that naturally lives in ephemeral water bodies, swamps, and marshes. But we searched in cattle ponds, which had year-long water. What makes the water really nice is the fresh cow shed. The turtles share these water bodies with cattle, horses, and countless waterfowl. We searched for over an hour with no luck. The Spixi probably noticed us awkwardly sloshing around in their habitat, but they proved hard to find. After almost 15 total man-hours of searching, we came up with only two specimens, both adult males. My name is David Fabius. I've been working with uh, Acantochelis Spixi, the grooved Cyanec, for many years. They have an extensive and flexible diet, which includes beetles in spring, and also tadpoles and invertebrates in summer. I strongly believe the cattle industry has helped these turtles survive in larger numbers because this area is subject to droughts. 
and when the ephemeral ponds dry out, the turtles find refuge in the cattle ponds where they can thrive for the rest of the summer. Satisfied with our good fortune, we began the long drive back. The following day, we visited David's reptile house, an old crumbling building which felt almost post-apocalyptic. His collection consisted of native and non-native species, U.S. king snakes, wood, spotted and American box turtles, along with many South American species, Ocantochilis spixi, Phrynops hilleri, William's eye, tuberculatus, Hydromedusa tectifora, and Maximiliani, and countless other species, along with two forms of Argentine tortoises. His reptile facility spoke for itself. It was primitive at best, and we were suddenly thankful that he had let us release the animals we found the day before back into the wild. We discussed the past descriptions of the different Argentine tortoises. Several decades ago, the Argentinian taxonomist Marcos Freiberg described several different species of reptiles that included Geocellone donoso barrosi and Geocellone petersi. We are still in doubt about what this means. The main thing is we have two main populations at least. On my left hand is a Patagonian male tortoise. This is the so-called Geocellone donoso barrosi. And this is a female Chaco tortoise, Geocellone chilensis. The Chacos are much smaller and Patagonians seem to be much more alert and responsive to the human presence than Chacos. We found that David had strong opinions about people's rights to keep and collect animals and the laws that govern them. All of us have valid knowledge or may have valid knowledge and even if we don't have knowledge, we have the right to pursue that knowledge. He used a cryptic biblical metaphor to express his views on conservation. But the future is not very good, it's most gloomy because some people uh, want uh, to do things like one of Solomon's uh, mothers. There were two women claiming to be the mothers of a baby and King Solomon was the judge. The king said, let's cut the baby in two pieces and let one of the, each of the women have one. And the true mother said, no, let her take it. The power struggle between biologists, conservationists, zoo people, private people like myself is cutting the baby into pieces. We were grateful for his help and generosity for taking us into the field, but we didn't share his exact views or philosophy on conservation. We left Uruguay and David Fabius behind and flew to the city of Mendoza. Here we met with Pepe Jose Gassel, the owner of a local serpentarium, who was knowledgeable about the region and who was hopefully going to direct us to localities where we could find Argentine tortoises. This was important since the original 1880 description of Giacelloni chilensis was collected in Mendoza. So agriculture eliminated all the tortoises. So he said they used to be good. It became clear that this was going to be easier said than done, since Mendoza had a huge wine and agricultural industry which had expanded far beyond the urban areas. The tortoises' habitat had shrunk to only the most inhospitable and undeveloped areas. He strongly recommended we go far to the north or south, since he felt our chances were remote. Very lucky. You got to be very lucky to find them. tortoises in this, any of this area. Chilense. And is it possible it could be a released tortoise from South Africa? Yeah, of course. That's but that's what they asked him because the guy. Y las personas, uh, you know, soltan tortugas. Tienen muchos años de ahí. Ah, van a solo. They go to the zoo. We were increasingly discouraged and frustrated with this news, as we began to accept the reality that we very well might not find any wild tortoises in this area. To confuse matters even further, he mentioned a fourth form of black tortoise, found only on hills covered with black volcanic rock in the southern Mendoza province. So this is the black, the black. The Don Rosso are darker. 
Are these darker than Donald Brunson? Son más negras que las de Donald Brunson. No, no, no. Son muy difíciles. No, más cómo se distingue la Donald Brunson de la negra. Es un negra, negra, negra. Oh, it's a black flash. After a number of phone calls, Pepe recommended we visit one of his friends. He claimed they had a tortoise that was found on a cattle ranch northeast of the city. We're here in Mendoza at the home of Gabriela. We met her father today, and he thought that this tortoise here was found on his property by his daughter, but was actually caught here in the city, so it's clearly not a wild tortoise. This news was discouraging, so collecting tissue samples on this specimen would be useless. Ryberg described in the early 70s the species as Donoborossi, and uh, it's very distinct from the Chaco tortoise we normally know of. Uh, we see here the, the very flat carapace. It's, it's very dark when they are younger. The centers of the skewts are dark and the surroundings are more bright, but this is an old male which is uniform uh, gray. We have a very white head and we look into the profile of the tortoise, we see a projecting distinct nose, which is also distinct from the Chaco tortoise. You can clearly see the difference from the two tortoises. This is clearly a northern form and this is what we're after. We would later discover that our descriptions were partially ill-informed and that the tortoises from this Mendoza region were distinctly different from the northern Chaco forms. As it turned out, these animals had more visual characteristics in common with the southern Patagonian forms. To say that we were a bit confused was an understatement. The fact is that within one population, there can be morphological variations. Young animals are different in appearance than older animals, and males can look different from females. It looks something like an intermediate form between the southern form and the northern form, but it's very tough to tell something about uh, just the carabas. We will see. We were about 200 kilometers northeast of Mendoza and began asking the local ranchers about any tortoise sightings. The good news was that they had recently seen tortoises. The bad news was that they all ended up on the dinner plate. This animal here is a large female that was just eaten yesterday. They cut their carapace off with a knife and they can live for a half hour to an hour while they're butchering them and they remove all the parts, they eat all the parts and they make it into a stew. They basically boil it. They also boil it to remove the skin and the scales. Bueno, hay mucha gente como yo que las come acá y son buenas, son muy buenas. Son. Because we found this freshly killed female, we are going to be able to get really good DNA samples. It's actually better than any tortoise we've seen so far. Mendoza is the terra typica of Chihilones, or let's say Chilanuides chilensis. So the tortoises which are found here in this area should be the real chilensis. Our search began at midday. It was already 90 degrees Fahrenheit and the ground temperature was well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Any tortoises that might be in the area were certainly hiding and inactive. This desert region is remarkably similar to our... Hey! hey! He's got one. Hey! Right, let's go, dude. This was the first tortoise found in the wild. We were relieved that this old female had avoided the stew pot, since it was only a few kilometers away from where the rancher had earlier shown us his pile of leftover carcasses. Our first impression was how different this animal was to the smaller Chaco tortoises we were so used to seeing in the U.S. pet trade. This tortoise looked more similar to a small African spurred tortoise with a uniformly straw-colored and heavily insculpted carapace, more pronounced overlapping scales, and distinctly flaring marginal scoots. 
The center of the scutes are known to be darker in the southern tortoises, but this only occurs with specimens that become darkened from the burnishing that occurs from the branches and roots they hide under. We're in a habitat that's remarkably similar to the Mojave Desert. I mean, there's a plant that literally looks exactly like the creosote bush. It has to be in the same family. There's trees that look like Palo Verdes. This Monte Desert region experiences virtually the same climatic conditions as the Mojave, and the vegetation is made up of many of the same species, with the creosote bush, Lores cunifolia, dominating most of the drier parts of the eco-region. It's a remarkable example of convergent evolution. The tortoises here not only resemble gophers, agazizae, and berlanderi, but share many of the same habits and habitat. What we've learned from these is that they're very similar in habits to our gopherous tortoise, one of the only other tortoises that digs a burrow. And this was something that we did not know about Chilensis. This burrow was at least the length of my arm, and I was fortunate enough not to get bitten by a crotalus or other snake. The tortoise's diet is composed almost exclusively of these tufts of bunch grass, Diplash dubin. Free-range horses, cattle and goats often outcompete the tortoises for the same food source. The tortoises possibly augment their diet by consuming the droppings of these intruders to get through the lean months. It later turned out that this was the only tortoise found on the trip in a deep burrow. We don't know if it was simply sharing a rodent burrow or if it actually excavated its own burrow in the soft sand. We should point out that back in the 70s, scientists wanted to change the genus to gopherus because of the obvious similarities in morphology and habits. It was later concluded that the Argentine tortoises' closest relative were the giants from the Galapagos, even though they are far more similar in appearance to our desert tortoises than any of their South American relatives. After almost 20 combined man-hours of searching in the summer heat, we came up with only two specimens, one adult female and one male. We recorded valuable data and collected tissue samples and left relieved that we had found animals in the wild. So we are here in the enclosure of the Chilenoides, Chilenoides, Chilensis in the Mendoza Zoo. And the more specimen I see here, the more confused I get. Um, we have a variety of different shaped specimens here and the bad thing is we don't know any origin because most of the animals are donations from, from people. They can origin out of the bat trade or they can be found in the area. Nobody knows. And for example, from the Greek tortoises in, in, in East Europe and, and, and Asian parts, we know that inside one population there can be very flat animals, which you can find in burrows, and there are very high domed animals, which are not digging at all, uh, but which are the same species. So you have a dimorphism or a polymorphism in one population. The whole situation here is very confusing. We have small animals, we have big animals, we have high domed animals, we have flat animals, we have males which have concave plastrons, we have males who have land plastron. So without doing the genetics, I cannot say anything. We carefully photographed and observed over 30 specimens. We suspect that most were found in the general region. There were many shapes, sizes, and ages, making any morphological conclusions problematic. Our last obligation was to visit Mariella Superina, a mammologist who has been studying armadillos and marsupials for the past eight years at the University of Mendoza. She offered to install our data loggers at her study site. We left Mendoza behind, driving south along the foothills of the Andes, destined for the deserts of the Neoquin province and the Patagonian tortoise. We drove for over 15 hours, mostly on dirt roads, through spectacular volcanic landscapes and deserts. At times, the road would disappear entirely, and there were hours on end where we didn't see a single car or person. Guanacas, chinchillas, and rias were abundant. 
Our final destination was in the lower elevation, hot Monte Desert ecosystem. There were dirt roads sprouting in every direction, making way for a massive installation of oil fields. We stopped on a gentle bluff littered with volcanic black outcropping and rocks. This was the location where the black form of Argentine tortoise was known to live. The landscape was harsh and barren, almost lunar in appearance. We searched for almost an hour without seeing any sign of life, with the exception of a few lizards. Maurice and Mie were already lying down in the back seat of the truck. Just as Peter and Eric were about to give up and call it a day, we spotted a tortoise under a rocky outcropping. We started searching in this area, thinking there's no way on earth we were going to find a tortoise, because this habitat was so different than the habitat we were in in the north, which was virtually sand dunes. There were no rocks. The landscape is extremely unforgiving. I've been completely cut up, and uh, this tortoise is so different than the chilensis we have at the center. It has a very, very wide head, and the typical chilensis from the northern Chaco region have really no concavity on the plastron, nor do they have this really large tail. So the sexual dimorphism in these guys here is very obvious, whereas the chilensis that we have been working with, you can really, it's, it's extremely difficult to tell the females from the males. It was midday and hot, yet we eventually found seven tortoises, two females and five males. All were inactive and hiding in shallow pallets under bushes and rocks for cover. To no one's surprise, none were truly black. Some of the older specimens' carapaces were darkened and smooth from the burnishing of their shells from years of going in and out of shallow pallets and wedging themselves under rocks. After four hours of hot sun and thorny vegetation, we noticed dark clouds were rolling in with the advent of a summer monsoon. Our tire blew on the rocky roads at a speed of over 100 kilometers an hour. The lock to the spare snapped off instantly and we were stranded in the middle of nowhere. We tried hacking, sawing and prying the lock off to no avail. The situation looked increasingly hopeless as the dark rain clouds and lightning loomed over us. But after 45 minutes, a crew of oil field workers stopped and saved us with a crowbar and lots of machismo. We headed south to the Neo King province across the Rio Colorado, which acts as a genetic barrier for many species of animals. En route, we found this armadillo crossing the road. She was petrified. It's a girl because it has two teeth. Good catch. Ah, ah. The edges are really short. Wow. He's really pooping. It's big nipples. After a quick examination, okay. we released her. Peter, what do you have there? I don't know. A Bothrop? And far too yeah. casually, Peter picked up this poisonous Bothrop. We're in the northern part of Nailquin province, just below the province of Mendoza, which is separated by the Rio Colorado. In fact, the Rio Colorado is just a few kilometers this way. It appears that the further south you go, the larger the tortoises become. The southern form is at least two-thirds larger than the small, round, northern Chaco variety, with distinct marginal flaring and a generally flatter and longer carapace, larger head, heavier scales, and much more obvious sexual dimorphism. Possibly, the dramatic increase in size relates to the severe winters that these animals experience, requiring more body mass to withstand the frigid nights. This tortoise endures extremely hot summers, 45 Celsius, to very cold winters where it even gets a dusting of snow. We're here in the spring, in December, when there should be the most for this guy to eat and there's virtually nothing. It's feeding on almost entirely dry grasses that are growing in the area and virtually nothing else. We examined a number of the scats of this tortoise and that's pretty much everything that it's been eating. But it's an extremely large tortoise for a chilensis. 
I think this might be the largest female we found on this trip, even in captivity or in the wild. We left satisfied with our luck in the field, with the exception of Maurice, who had still not found a single tortoise. Eric was about ready to stage an animal in his path in order to brighten his spirits. The Argentine tortoise lives further south than any other tortoise species in the world. Oddly, there isn't a single aquatic turtle species represented in the Rio Colorado, Rio Negro, or anywhere to the south of these large river systems. As we headed south, we couldn't stop noticing the folk art shrines that decorated the roadside. Adorned with red flags, used water bottles, and car parts, honoring the saint-like gaucho Antonio Gill, a sort of gaucho Robin Hood of the past. As the superstition has it, you must honk when passing the shrines, or bad luck will be bestowed on your travels. Perhaps our prior flat tire was due to a forgotten and past shrine, and the gaucho sent us a little bad luck. We'd better start honking. Conveniently, one of Eric's friends from New York, an Italian nobleman named Piero Incisa della Rochetta, owned a winery along the Rio Colorado and invited us to stay at his villa. The winery was close to our last study site. Ironically, his business is one of the many threats to the tortoise's survival, since vineyards are slowly displacing tortoise habitat in some areas. We weren't exactly the chic New York visitors they'd expected. We arrived tired, filthy, cut up, and covered in insect bites and scrapes from the countless thorny plants in the desert. Piero had arranged a personal chef for us and an assistant to take care of all our needs. Cheers! from Argentina, Patagonia. They served us their own fine wine and everything imaginable to eat. For one night, we lived like kings and slept like babies. The next morning, Mie prepared breakfast, Peter was up early, and Maurice slept in. Before leaving this lap of luxury, we installed data loggers and headed north for the final leg of our trip to Santiago del Estero. From the plain, you could see the endless tracks of agriculture displacing the dry forests of the Chaco. This was a very hot, poor, and inhospitable region. Our first destination was the local zoo, a depressing place without a single visitor in sight. The type of zoo that gives zoos a bad name. Peter lunged for a basking Phrynops hillari. Peter caught the one turtle that's <laughs> missing a foot and an eye. This is the tortoise that we're typically used to seeing in the pet trade in the United States, the Chaco tortoise from this Chaco region in the north. It's really a small animal compared to what we saw in the southern part of Argentina. Esta tortuga de, de donde viene? En toda la provincia se la puede encontrar, sí. Okay. Y, um, es, eh, tiene mucha la densidad de la tortuga en esta área. Uh, es grande o poco? We couldn't leave this depressing zoo and Santiago del Estero soon enough. It took hours to reach the town of Colonia Dora and a habitat that was less impacted by agriculture and more suitable for tortoises. The landscape in the Chaco was vastly different from the southern Monte Desert region. The ecosystem is primarily a dry, deciduous forest with three to four levels of vegetation, canopy and sub-canopy trees, a shrubby understory, and cacti and herbaceous grasses. Almost all of the vegetation is extremely thorny and sharp. It's estimated that there are over 1,000 species of plants, allowing for a far more diverse diet for these tortoises than their southern counterparts. The native Apuntia is a favorite. We began to ask the local farmers if tortoises were in the area. Tienen para vender tortugas en esta área? Hoy hemos soltado una así. Ah, usted soltó. Hoy. Hoy hemos soltado. Ah, okay. Our first tortoise was a surprise as we drove down a dusty dirt road. Maurice was ecstatic. 
found my first Chaco tortoise, remarkably, sitting on the, the, the back of the truck and spotted it on the side of the road. It's the perfect time of day. It's about 8 p.m. The sun is going down and they're coming out to feed uh, just before the sun goes down. The next morning, we met up with our guide who was supposedly knowledgeable about the species in the area. We were especially interested in finding what Freiburg described as the Giocelloni Peter's Eye, which is apparently sympatric, at least in part of its range, with Giocelloni chilensis. ¿Qué tipo de tortuga es esta? Es una pirusai. Uh, es un, es un, un pirusai. Seguro que es una. They're describing this animal as a pirusai, and we just believe that they're just finding males, and because they're smaller, they're a pirusai. But he's very, very confident that this is a pirusai. We began to lose any faith we had with our guide's knowledge, since we could see that this population of Chaco tortoises was one single species or subspecies. Wow. We just found our smallest tortoise in this pallet over here. You saw it just the way we found it here in the Chaco. The diet of this tortoise is really distinctly different than the diet of the uh, Patagonia tortoise, which is pretty much eating nothing but grass. In this area, there's many more plant species that these guys are eating. I just found this very large old male uh, Chilensis, which is showing some shell rot. But the interesting thing about this tortoise is the size of the tick here next to the left foot of this tortoise. And you can see it's completely engorged with blood. In just over a few hours, we had collected two females, three males, and one juvenile. Our next stop was to visit one of the many tortoise collectors in the region. I'm here with George near Colonia Dora in the state of Santiago del Estero and uh, he is uh, a laborer and he says he collects about a hundred tortoises a year. The tortoises that he does sell, he says they're a hundred percent for the pet trade. He's seen them all his life so he, he seems to have no problem collecting them and taking them out of the wild. Unfortunately, people need to be educated here a little bit more about conservation but it is very, very poor. I can't even imagine these kids are even going to school. They take siesta five hours a day, basically from 12 noon to 5 p.m., people don't do anything. They sit home and, and either play hammer throw, which is a popular game, or just hang out, it seems. With little or no education, their only chance for survival is to live off the land, hunting for bushmeat and tortoises, producing charcoal, and raising pigs, chickens, and goats is all they know. The diversity of fauna is high in a Chaco, and subsistence and sport hunting are popular. The word Chaco comes from their indigenous language and means hunting land. The tortoises are sold as pets primarily, but one old custom is still practiced. The locals believe that after placing a tortoise under their bed, a person with asthma will automatically be cured once the tortoise dies. It was clear that the laws protecting the tortoises and other wildlife were only as good as the paper they were written on. By far the greatest threat to these tortoises in the Chaco, more than collecting, overgrazing, and charcoal production combined, was the recent mass deforestation of the land, giving way to the genetically modified soy and sunflower cultivation. An estimated 3,000 square kilometers of Argentine forest is cleared every year in order to plant soy, Argentina's latest prize crop. Over the course of two weeks, we examined over 70 tortoises, 20 of which we collected in the field and the rest from captive specimens. Since the range of the Argentine tortoise is continuous from north to south, well over 2,000 kilometers and not disjunct, the probability is that we are looking at different subspecies and not distinct species. We know the populations from the Chaco in northern Argentina, Paraguay and southern Bolivia are morphologically distant being much smaller, rounder animals than the forms occurring in the southern portion of their range in the harsher Monte Desert region of southern Mendoza and Neoquin provinces. As the two populations merge towards the middle of their range in central Argentina and around the city of Cordoba, where the forests of the Chaco give way to the deserts of the south, they begin to share morphological similarities exhibiting characteristics of both forms. 
We knew that the original description of Giocelloni chilensis, described by Gray in 1880, from the Mendoza region, would remain consistent. Where the confusion lies is in the northern and southern races. Are these subspecies? Distinct species? Or the same species? With the advent of mitochondrial DNA, we hope that we can finally unravel this puzzle and not base our conclusions on morphology alone. Was Freiberg right in 1973 when he described two distinct species? Or was Buzzcock correct in the early 80s when he suggested that they were all one species? In the upcoming months, we hope to find the answers to these questions and solve one of the countless Chelonian mysteries. Our trip was coming to a close, and we were all tired from the endless, long, hot days, crammed into a four-wheel drive truck. Tensions are, are pretty high on this trip. Uh, we're starting to get on each other's nerves. We were shook down by cops last night for money. Um, uh, last night almost had chiggers, or, or these, these bugs that are like bed bugs that transmit Chagas disease, so uh, we were really worried about that. Mosquitoes keeping us up all night. Um, thankfully, Eric threw some cacti onto my bags, and now the little needles are all over my bags, and uh, they're, anytime you touch my bag, you get pricked with needles, so that's a lot of fun. Um, I really liked my trip here in Argentina, but I'm kind of glad it's almost over. It was day 13, and we had almost two days' journey ahead of us. Having successfully collected enough data on the tortoises in the region, we made the decision to take one last detour east, which turned out to be over 1,000 kilometers out of our way to search for the rarely seen Ucantochiles pallidipectorus, a species that inhabits small marshes, ponds, vernal pools, and ephemeral water bodies that can dry out by summer's end. A turtle that will estivate for long stretches in the dry mud, only reappearing at the onset of rains. Little is known about the natural history of this enigmatic species, but it is probable that they are only active during the wet spring and early summer months, going dormant throughout the rest of the year. This turtle has the adaptation to just go into the mud when it dries out and estivate, and so it's really similar to the western swamp turtle uh, in these vernal pools. And we're right now getting just nailed by mosquitoes um, really badly. The mosquitoes were unbearable and repellent was useless, making the experience anything but pleasurable. We painstakingly searched pond after pond with the same result. This was the first time we came up empty-handed. The local farmers and fishermen informed us that the turtles were increasingly scarce, having seldom seen any in recent years. They only encountered them during summer thunderstorms crossing the roads. After many interviews, we finally found a local farmer who was keeping a few turtles as pets in small buckets behind his home. We knew they wouldn't live long under these conditions and tried to negotiate a price in order to repatriate them back into a nearby swamp. He obviously didn't come across these turtles frequently since he would not part with them at any cost. We drove back for hours through islands of fragmented forests separated by huge tracts of agriculture. As the sun began to wane, it seemed only fitting that we would cross paths one last time with one of our old friends. Oblivious to passing trucks and cars, we pulled over and safely released him onto the side of the road and drove on into the night. This trip and the research that was conducted was a collaboration between our Argentine colleagues and the Turtle Conservancy. We look forward to sharing our findings in the coming months with the entire scientific community. Okay, go. We're in Buenos Aires at one of the Buenos oldest zoos start. in South America. Start, start. We're in Buenos Aires hold in Argentina. And the uh, tortoise seems to be more stinky than I am. We're northeast of we are northeast of Mendoza right now at a ranch um, from a. Uh, we, what should I say? Okay. We're northeast of Mendoza. Um, 
What is this area called? But this has nothing to say whether it's the same species, the same subspecies, or, the, or whether we are... I hear you. Oh. Sorry. What did she say? She said you're an asshole. Well, that's obvious. Yeah, there's tons of mosquitoes. Do we have mosquito? Do we have mosquito repellent? Yeah, my green bag. Marisa, in the green bag where? It's really a lot there. These tortoises around Mendoza get much larger. Can, can you deal with that? And a very short period when it's active here in late spring. I, I pronounced everything wrong.